Okay, we'll do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pursuant to the declared emergency uh, or state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Virginia in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and to protect the public health, safety, and regional connector study working group members, staff, and the general public, today's meeting is uh, being held electronically. These electronic meetings are required to complete essential business on behalf of the region. Per the requirements of the Code of Virginia, the agenda and all supporting documentation were posted on the HRTPO website for public review, and electronic copies of this information were provided to the RCS working group members and other interested parties. A recording is being made of today's meeting and will be posted on the HRTPO and RCS websites. The general public was provided an opportunity to comment on today's meeting via two options. Uh, first of all, members of the public were invited to submit public uh, submit elect, uh, e email comments to the RCS working group. And secondly, members of the public were invited to call into a dedicated phone line where comments could be recorded for the RCS working group. No comments were received as of 48 hours prior to today's meeting. Uh, before we begin the meeting, I'd like to review a few housekeeping rules, which are important as we uh, continue this meeting. Uh, first of all, all members are asked to keep their phones and computers muted, except for when you're providing input. Secondly, uh, please identify yourself uh, when speaking by providing your name and locality or agency you represent. And do the same should you provide a motion or a second. This is important in particular for the recording. And finally, all votes taken today must be made by roll call vote and recorded in the minutes. Thank you for your cooperation and patience and attendance will now be recorded by roll call. Okay. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the RCS Working Group. And when I call your name, please uh, indicate uh, if you're or not. Starting with the city Earl Story. Earl Story. Uh, Troy Burger. Uh, present. Thank you, Troy. City of Hampton, uh, Jason Mitchell. Jason Mitchell. Lynn Keenan. This is Sane and Rogers. I'm sitting in for Lynn Keenan. Thank you. Uh, from Newport News, our chair, Brian Steely. Present. Angela Reichel. Present. Good morning. Good morning, Angela. Thank you. From the city of Norfolk, Brian Fowler. Here. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Good morning. Here. From Portsmouth, right? James Wright, the Portsmouth, Carl Jackson. I'm here. Good morning, Carl. From mm -hmm. the city of Jason Souders. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Jason. From Virginia Beach, Rick Loman. I'm here. Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Cole Fisher. I'm here. Good morning. Morning. From VPA, Barbara Nelson. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Barbara. From the Navy, Michael King. Michael King. From the Corps, Jason Flowers. George Janik. Hi, Camelia. I'm here. Good morning, George. Thank you. From the Coast Guard, Jean Leonard. Jean Leonard. From the Federal Highway Administration, Ivan Rucker. 
Ivan Rucker. From VDOT, Pam Phillips. I'm here. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Uh, Eric Stringfield. Eric Stringfield. From HR Tag, Kevin Page. Kevin Page. From Hunter Roads Transit, Ray Amaruso. Ray Amaruso. From Rosa. Oh, did I hear somebody from Hunter Roads Transit? It's not. Uh, from her own for Rick Squire. And from the consultant team, Craig Eddy. I'm on. Thank you, Craig. Good morning. Lorna morning. Parkin. Okay. Uh, from the staff. My camera. I'm okay. here. Okay. Yeah, they're all here. And Kate Nichols. And any other ones that I did not call? Camelia, this is Craig. This is Craig. Uh, we have two other consultant team members on today. Uh, Bill Thomas is on, and Anthony Donald. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, I'm turning it to um, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Camille. Um, my understanding, we don't have any public comments. We'll move. That's, that's correct. I'm number four, uh, 70 minutes from the October 27th uh, Joint Policy Committee and Working Group meeting. I trust everyone's had time to review them. Does anyone have any comments or questions for them? Hearing none, can I get a motion to approve? Brian Fowler, I move approval of the minutes. Thank you, sir. I have a motion. Can I get a second? For another test peak second. Thank you. Mike, do we need a roll call vote or can we go by consensus? I, th I think we can go by a consensus. Uh, well, let's see for minutes. I think we can go by consensus on that. All right. Uh, having a uh, motion and a second. Does anyone have any objections to the motion? All right, hearing none, we'll call that consensus. Moving to item number five, uh, development or preliminary alternatives. Mr. Eddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian. So, um, wanted to start by just reminding you how we got to today's meeting. At the next slide, please. Um, at the joint meeting in October, it was decided that uh, the consultant team would limit our investigation of refinements and mandated segments to the five. Um, those five mandated segments that you see there on the screen. So that was the charge. Um, and since we were given that charge, the next slide shows what we've been up to um, since that time. Um, we had we have prepared a draft uh, travel demand model evaluation memo that was distributed um, before Thanksgiving. We got comments. We're currently on that. Um, we resumed work on the technical guide, which is kind of the summer report for scenario uh, planning. Um, hoping to have a draft to you sometime in early January on that. And then um, we made two travel demand model runs, which we'll show you the results of in a minute. But we wanted to try to understand uh, the utility of the mandated segment. So we ran a model run with unconstrained, which means no capacity restrictions. Um, for the existing plus committed network. And then we ran another unconstrained run um, 
with the E plus C network and all the mandated segments. So it's either none of it or all of it, just to show a comparison. And then we developed a matrix, which you'll see in a minute, um, to show the difference um, in the volumes. And we picked uh, 13 different locations around the region just to show the comparison between what you were accustomed to in 2017. People can always relate to an existing condition and then the two unconstrained runs. So that's what that's what we've been up to, and we're prepared to show you the results of those model runs and that matrix here in a second. Next slide, please. So um, we're going to try to bring in the the map that shows the locations we picked, plus the volumes at those locations to stimulate some discussion here. So um, there you see the. Um, 13 locations, uh, it's actually 16 when you count the, the mandated segments, uh, 14, 15, and 16. Um, so it's a co they're color-coded around the region. Uh, we picked um, noteworthy facilities that we thought, what, that we, what we thought were key locations. The first three are the crossings, James River Bridge, Monitor Merrimack, and um, HRBT, and then on down the line. So. Um, and then for each of those locations, you see the volume comparison on the right, uh, we have um, four conditions shown, the 2017 existing, the 2045 baseline, then the 2045 unconstrained with just the E plus C network, and then we have the 2045 uh, unconstrained run adding in the five mandated segments to the um, E plus C network. So you've seen the first two columns for the 2017 existing and the 2045 baseline. But what's most interesting for today's discussion purposes is those last two columns on the right. Um, and um, you can see that with the unconstrained run, um, the harbor crossings increased by about 16 or 17 percent. Um, and then you can see um, the impacts that the adding the segments have on um, the other 13 links. The, the mandated segments are numbered 14, 15, and 16. So with them carrying almost 80,000 on the 564 connector, 56,000 on the 660 on the 664 connector and then about 235 on the 164 connector with uh, traffic distributing itself a little bit differently you can see the impacts between the unconstrained run and the unconstrained run with five segments so it's a small drop on the James River bridge there's a big increase on the monitor Merrimack there's a drop on the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, about the same on at location four. Big jump on 564 west of uh, I-64. A um, little bit of a drop at six. A uh, little bit of a drop. Well, actually, it's percentage-wise, it's a pretty big drop on uh, the Midtown Tunnel. Uh, not too much difference on segment eight there, 264. That's the downtown tunnel. A uh, little bit of a drop, I-64 over the Elizabeth River. A little bit of a drop on 264 just east of Bowers Hill. Um, another drop on 664 just north of Bowers Hill. Another drop on 464 just south of 264. And a drop on 164 just east of I-664. And I, and I already mentioned the, the volumes on the three mandated segments. So um, we wanted to present this and um, stimulate some conversation. Uh, we'll probably come back to these two slides, Keith, but um, the next, if you'll advance the next slide, um, this will we'll turn it over to Brian to start some discussion. So, um, So what we're trying to determine today is what combinations of segments make sense to deem as alternatives for the consultant team to study. And part of that discussion should probably include 
whether we consider any other segments besides the mandated segments, um, for example, the James River Bridge, which would give us another harbor crossing improvement. Everything else is not really a crossing improvement. It's something else. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to lead the discussion of the working group members. And Keith, it would probably be helpful to go back to the shared view between the, the location and the volume, as I'm sure people will refer to that in the discussion. Any any questions before we start the discussion about what I've outlaid for everybody? Hey Craig, this is this is George Janik with the core. Um I I just have a question and, and if I'm jumping ahead, I apologize. But um segment five, I five sixty four west of I sixty four. Um one thing that, that jumps out at me is like you already pointed out, is that big increase in volume um i i would like to know maybe what what do you all think is driving that and um if if that wouldn't continue on i guess to 14 and 15 but it actually looks like there's a pretty big drop off when you get to the uh the additional harbor crossing there so i i just maybe need a little bit of help understanding that number and also um why that there's kind of uh you know why there's a void between that segment and 14 and 15 and do you all think that 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 um traffic volume is going to ports and stopping there not proceeding across maybe the uh the harbor there so i i just um wanted wanted to ask about that okay that's very insightful um i'm going to turn it over to bill thomas to answer that george he's uh more familiar with the model and you know, has done some experimentation and some probing. So he he's probably the best person to answer that one. Bill, would you mind stepping to the plate on that one? You might be on mute, Bill. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great, excellent. So, on location five, you, you can see that when we go from baseline to the unconstrained without the uh, mandated segment, there's an increase anyway, and that's because there's no capacity restrictions in that run. And then we pop up by another 70,000, or well, let's see, I guess it's about another 70,000 uh, when we add the mandated segments, and, and that's mostly due to what you see, I, I believe on 14, uh, on location 14, where you know there's a draw of about 80,000 vehicles. This is daily two-way traffic. Uh, so the the fact that, I mean, if you think about it, uh, th these mandated segments, what they're really doing is they're kind of completing a circumferential highway in in the metropolitan area, and so. So we see the increase at location five, and then that translates to an increase in 14. And, and then, mm -hmm. as you can see, the, the uh, 15 plus 16 exactly equal the, the volume at location 14. So what you've got there is, you, mm -hmm. is as you move west, uh, you're seeing of that about 80,000 on location 14, you're seeing about uh, 23, uh, thousand to twenty four thousand uh taking one sixty four and uh and then the remaining uh fifty six thousand uh moving over to uh to the monitor merrimack and and if you look at monitor merrimack location number two uh moving north uh you you'll see that there's an increase of about twenty five thousand and so 25,000 of that 56,000 is crossing the harbor, and then the remainder is uh, proceeding south. Does that make sense? It, it does, thank you. And so again, you can see that there's, you know, about, you know, about half of the 56,000 that are really just uh, using 
the mandated segments to complete a movement, uh, you know, in the region uh, that's afforded by this connection I spoke about that really gives you a complete circum circumferential uh, route around the metropolitan area. This is Brian Fowler. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, I just just want to, I guess, suggest or remind. I'm not sure which that you know this exercise is something we wanted to do. It's a good high level exercise. It is particularly focused on the harbor crossings and not what happens inland. Because there's all kinds of other things going on in the model when you do an unconstrained run that are going to have huge impacts. And I'll just throw out the one that you just said. It could be that in this unconstrained model run, you find that there's a whole lot of people that don't use Hampton and Terminal instead of going to 564. And that's why you see this giant leap on 564. You know, there's all kinds of things going on on other streets that we're not seeing in these numbers. That could be the cause of some very odd looking things uh, inland. Um, but as far as the harbor crossings, it's more about just if, if you unconstrain the harbor crossings, what do you do from the standpoint of demand between the peninsula and the south side? Um, and and looking at looking at those, I mean, ultimately there may be ramifications to to higher volumes to to places inland, but this this is not the place to be looking at trying to look at those kinds of numbers yet um and i i guess um greg i i think it would be really helpful and i don't know if you have it something that you can it can be ready to look at but you know there was a lot of other modeling activities runs um the the more detailed analysis and and you know pardon me i <laughs> i've had a brain uh, recently uh, that I, I can't even remember the name of that other tool that I <laughs> I wanted you guys to use. It's free something, I think. Um, but um, free there's a lot of other, there's a lot, it's free valve, free valve. Thank you. Um, there's, there's a lot of other model runs and analysis that are ahead of us that should be things that are coming in the next, I, I would assume two to three months. Um, that are going to be more, that are going to really drill down and, and taking a much harder look at all of these things. Um, and I think at this point, the this was like a first tier, you know, just kind of look at look at things to, you know, may, maybe see if if anything popped out as something obvious to look at differently, um, and. I think it suggests that yes, there still appears to be a, a benefit to adding capacity for crossing the harbor, and in fact, for adding a third crossing. Um, and I think, in terms of other alternatives, alignments, and I, and again, want to keep keep reminding folks that alternative designs and alternative alignments are two different things, um, that there's really not that many combinations. Um, you know, there's the third crossing without 16, there's 16 with 14, and if you want to, there's 16 with 15, although that one's never really been studied before, and I'm not sure that one makes a whole lot of sense, but um, I think we were gonna run those different combinations uh, anyway um, to see, to drill down a little bit more to see how things look when you do comparisons. And we were going to do some of those runs for all of the scenarios. So it just, before we start talking too much about this, it would be good to be reminded about all of the things that were coming. Uh, Rob, you have a comment? Uh, no, I'm, I'm handling it offline. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Craig and Bill, um, I may have missed something, uh, when you were presenting the slides, but when you're saying, um, 
with your volume comparison table, you had said the mandated segment several times being added to that last column, but I'm only seeing the addition of the the three the three segments that you know we referred to previously as Patriots Crossing. So um, I want to make sure in that when you add the mandated segments in that volume run that you are adding all five mandated segments. So that would include the capacity on uh, 664 as well. It's a little unclear in the table. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and Bill can clean up after me, but um, because it was an uncontained run where capacity was not a factor, tolls were not a factor, we didn't do anything to those two segments because they already exist. Uh, we only put in those segments that weren't already in the network. Um, we certainly would do what you asked, you know, if we uh, did a constrained run, but with an unconstrained, uh, the number of lanes and tolls don't matter anyway. And since those two are basically widening of existing facilities, they were already in the network. Yeah, so what's important is this, we're reflecting the connectivity of the the added roadways. Okay, so so to be to be clear, since it's unconstrained, we're not worried about any um, capacity restrictions by adding this new east west movement coming into six sixty four. Right. Correct? Right. And then I, I would just caution, like if anyone were to jump in late, you know, just to say the mandated segments for Patriots. Um, it threw me off, <laughs> so uh, just a caution against just calling those 3 Patriots crossing segments as the mandated segments. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. We have other questions from the floor. All right, we're hearing none. Uh, looking at the uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of what we need for successful segments is an origin and destination. Uh, it would appear that with the HRBT widening, almost all of our crossing between the pencil and the south side would you know, be rooted through modern Merrimack for the immediate network. Um, I would push that whatever segments come out of the, you know, the alternatives come out of the segments that, that we look at making sure we're going shore to shore and then any interior pieces with the 164 connector, that sort of thing to, to tie a reasonable set of these together. Uh, open the floor for nomination and segments. Or alternatives. This is Brian Fowler, and I guess I really don't understand what. I mean, I, I would. I don't know if all of the segments are still in play. I don't know if. I would. I would think they are at this point because I don't think. I'm not sure if we know enough. If someone, if someone thinks that there's a segment that shouldn't be studied any further, I guess that would be. You know, something to bring up. Um, but um, the assuming again, I think that would be the only thing that would happen at this point potentially is if for some reason, based on this information, we would remove something. I, I just don't think we're we're there. I think this is a nice high level first look at things, but I think there's more model runs to look at before we would um discard anything and and then and then if we if we did or didn't we'd move forward with understanding um what some of the challenges are related to the design alternatives of these segments and start working on you know seeing if we can't come up with design alternatives that make more sense for you know, these new, all of these new findings and conditions and, and goals and so forth, rather than just sticking to the ones that were essentially developed 20 years ago. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think there's still some work to do before we start having more conversation, having conversations about what it, what it means to be talking about um, alternatives.
This is Barb Nelson. Um, Brian, thanks for those comments and um, and I think the port would agree with you. Well, Brian, I need you to, to provide some clarity on what direction you would provide to the consultant team for activity to to better get an understanding of, of how the, the pieces would go together. Well, I, and again, I'm I, I don't have the scope in front of me. Um, it's it's been quite a while since we talked about all of these things. It's certainly over a year, maybe a couple of years, um, but I'm pretty sure there were some items in the scope about looking at multiple model runs related to different combinations of segments. Um, and they may or may not have included also doing them for multiple scenarios. Um, and again, I, I just don't remember what all those things were, how they, how they were described in the scope, but at, at a basic level, um, and, and again, it could be certainly, I think, to 2045 baseline, you know, is the place to start, um, is, you know, basically there's, again, I think there's three different combinations of, of the new segments, and there's, there's the improvements that were part of the mandated segments Originally, the widenings of I-664, um, and, and I believe Brian, if I recall, those—I mean, those went all the way from. I can't remember if the, if, if there were widening shown all the way from Bowers Hill all the way up, all the way back up to I-64. I know there were in Newport News. I know that the. I think it showed eight lanes on I-664 in, in Newport News. Um, I don't know if it went all the way down to Bowers Hill, but th those very things that Dale, I think, was just referring to, um, you know, those put those in the network, put the different combinations of the new segments and and run those for um, the 2045 baseline. Um, and then from there, we might decide we should look at some of those additional for for the scenarios as well. Um, but I think that's the, that's the place that we have to start. And, and I guess to, to try to alleviate any fears that that sounds like a ton of work, I guess, and, you know, they can pipe in, but I don't, I don't think that's a lot of work and taking a, taking a segment in or out and rerunning the model and spitting out the results isn't a lot of work. Um, so, I mean, that's what I think needs to happen next to that that's the set of information that we would have that would really get us down to looking at helping helping drive the process of continuing uh, continuing to de to better develop design alternatives and or making any decisions about you know, adding anything in or taking anything out. This is George Danik with the core. I, I think I would agree with um with with Brian and Barbara too. I and and um Brian Stilly as well is um especially for the six sixty four um alternative, it seems like it only only be logical, like you said, Brian Stilly, to take it shore to shore. I mean to stop it um, and and stub it out at segment 15 um, assumes that 15 and 14 would be constructed and to go um, really from segment 15 and two all the way down to 13 or, or if that's Bowers Hill I'm not I'm not sure if if um, or, or the if that I guess that's a connection to 164 um, but I I think that would provide some um, valuable information when it comes to alternatives analysis as well so. I just put that comment out as kind of an additional information. Um, you know, the core is a non-voting member uh, of this study, but I, I think that would be an important um, piece of the uh, of the puzzle um, to have that information. 
Brian, this is Craig Eddy. Um, with regard to Brian's question about scope, the scope reads that uh, we'll be responsible for evaluating 10 alternatives at this stage. And those 10 alternatives will just be run against baseline traffic. We don't get into adding in the, the various scenarios until we narrow it down to the candidate alternatives, which is down the track a bit. So uh, we're not gonna be doing four runs for each of these 10 alternatives. We're just gonna be running it at the baseline level. And oh, I, uh, I guess I, I mean, responding back to that, Craig, again, those 10 alternatives, a lot of them are going to be a design variation on a, a segment that is not really going to impact, you know, traffic volumes necessarily. Um, you know, the uh, you completed you completed my sentence because uh, you're you're spot on, uh, and the the graphic that's on the map there showed two only to a certain level, but the mandated segment I believe goes all the way down to Bowers Hill. And, um, you know, so we may do combinations of that. This doesn't take into account express lanes. Um, there are all those kinds of um, features that can be um, altered. You know, even if you have the same segments, you can change the design features of those same segments and create a new alternative. So you're exactly right. Well, and, and I think, George, I think, Craig, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the purpose of the map here was just to identify a link between the map and the segments in the table. You know, it wasn't like you said; it was an unconstrained run, and it didn't really matter what what was coded in terms of how many lanes on each facility. I think that was I think modeling volume locations is is just you know what you what you intended to show there. The yeah, we just picked those links reference for the table. Um, so I think that. Craig, you know, I I hear what you say about moving from a tier to another tier, preliminary to candidate, um, and uh, so and and maybe my comment about running more running things against multiple scenarios in my head. I mean, yes, I was just thinking ahead, and maybe that was just in the candidate section. Um, but is it is it not? Is it not important or necessary at this stage to at least for the just running the 2045 baseline to you know to run the the three different network alternatives? Which when I say network alternative, it's it's like Bill used the term connectivity. It really represent the three different platforms of connections that you're you're creating um yeah we 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 intend to run the model with 2045 baseline numbers for 10 different combinations of segments slash there, there are 10 different design, combinations. or you know slash design features so there's, there's yeah. a lot more there's a lot more than 10 potential alternatives depending on what kind of design features you put in the five seconds Greg, correct me if I'm wrong there, you're looking for us to provide some guidance on which segments we want to put together for the runs? Yes, exactly. And I think it would probably be a tiered, it would probably be a tiered process, Brian. You know, we'd look maybe at unconstrained runs at things, um, combinations, and then um, seeing how those perform and, and compare to one another. We may want to um, drill a little deeper or those that look like they get more utility. We may start to uh, develop some different design uh, features for the same combination of segments. But I think the next tier is uh, unconstrained runs for a combination of segments. Um. Well, I, I and again, I, I, I'm suggesting that the combination of segments is, and, and it, I think, I think everybody hopefully can agree that this is kind of hard to do virtually. But, um, I mean, I six sixty four is is more of a commonality than 
than anything else here. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of how many lanes it is. And whatever was coded, whatever was in the SEIS, and I, again, I just, I don't remember. I think it was eight lanes all the way from I-64 to maybe 164. And it might've been six lanes down to Bowers Hill. I don't know. I don't recall that. I don't know if you do, Brian Stilly, but whatever that was, that, that could be that combined with 15 and 14, that's one. 16 and 14, that's two. And if other and if others think, and I don't, this one has not been proposed before, and I don't know if it makes any sense, 16 and 15, that, I mean, 16 and 15 without 14, that would be three, but I don't, again, I don't think that one is one that here to four has been even proposed. Um, so that's two or three. That's and, and and again, that's that's a starting point. You know, that that it, it's a stepwise approach potentially, like you said. That we, we're not going to define ten now. I think we need to learn a little bit before we suggest more. Um, and I think those two or three, um, and I think, I don't know. I think, I think 2045 baseline is the appropriate way to initially look at those opposed to the unconstrained. Um, Craig, this is Barb Nelson. I have a, a question. Uh, I am absolutely not a modeler, and so I apologize if this is uh, too basic of a question. But why would we why, why would we measure or test these alternatives against the unconstrained when we we live in a in a, I mean it seems that it has to be. Constraints have to be in place. I don't. Can you can you share with me what why we would, and and maybe I misunderstood um, a comment. I thought I thought you had said that it was uh, that it would be the alternatives would be tested against the unconstrained. Um, thanks. Yeah, I may have conflicted myself, but with regard to your question, the the purpose of the unconstrained is to see where people really want to travel, rather than the way they're forced to travel with capacity and tolling constraints. So if you really see what the demand is on the link, you can then decide, okay, you know, that's what that's how people would like to travel, but they're forced to go other places. So that's that's the benefit of it. And that's why we started these with unconstrained to see where people really would like to go. All right. That thank you for that clarification. That I did understand. I just I wanted to uh, just confirm that the alternatives that we would be selecting, or I'm not a, the port isn't a voting member, so that the group would be selecting that that it was being tested not against an unconstrained, or 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 is that true that it will be tested against an unconstrained? Yeah. For example, alternative whatever becomes alternative one combination of segments will be run and compared then against the unconstrained. Is that is that the case? And it would would it be the 2045 unconstrained that it would be tested against? I'm just trying to understand Brian's um, uh, Fowler's comment about testing against the 2045 baseline versus the choice to um, test against unconstrained. Well, I uh, we can do it. We can do it either way, whatever the group decides. Um, but we do it consistently so you can see um, how things are performing. But if if, if, you do, if people don't want the young constraint to see where people really want to go and they want to start putting uh, estimating the number of lanes needed, um, and we can add that to the network, then we can certainly do that. I just thought in a tiered approach, you'd start with unconstrained to see, um, like I mentioned, where people really wanted to go, and then you could decide uh, if it made sense to provide the lanes in the areas where they did. Um, and this is 
Bill Thomas, if you're going to be testing anything that involves uh, capacity expansion, you know, then you then you'd have to test it with a 2045 baseline constrained condition. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're not going to be seeing the effects of that dimension of the alternative. Uh, Brian, and um, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a, it's not six and one half and dozen the other, it's certainly two different approaches. Um, and I completely understand the logic behind the unconstrained. Um, and the unconstrained for me was always about two things, not just, not just looking at the number of lanes, but, you know, in a higher, higher context and our ultimate looking at goals and objectives and so forth, you know, that you know, the the real ultimate desire for travel between, you know, the peninsula and the south side and and evaluating, you know, what that total demand really is and, and trying to come close to opening up, you know, opening up the floodgates, if you will, to allow it to be, to allow it to actually happen, to allow it to serve, but understanding that not, as we move forward, we op, we op, we clearly have to be looking at the 2045 baseline runs, and that's what our that's what our ultimate decisions related to um, what to try to move forward with in terms of projects are are mostly going to be driven by because that's the standard that they have to be compared against. Or, I mean, that, those are the, those are the numbers that are going to have to appear in an EIS. Um, the, you know, the, the the numbers that go with the, you know, with the official model, uh, the the official data set for that year. You know, all of those things. You know, all of these other things, the unconstrained, the scenarios, they're all about testing you know, some in some ways a sensitivity analysis. In some ways, um, you know, trying to, you know, maybe make sure that you don't do a project that sink that, that might be limiting for, you know, a, a future, a future expectation or what have you. Um, struggling with the words a little bit, but um, we do ultimately have to be looking at the 2045 model. Uh, uh, official, I hate to use that word, but official. Um, and if we if we did those runs now those two or three sets with with unconstrained um i mean that would be okay but i think you know pretty quickly we're going to have to be looking at the at the 2045 baseline volumes because we can't ignore those yeah i can so brian the uh, the baseline gives you a very uh pragmatic starting point Especially as, as we're looking at the whole of this activity, you know, there's going to be sections that are required that we're doing a, a capacity increase and not a new link. So getting into the, if I give you an extra lane here or I, I shortcut that piece there, you know, and, and provide some congestion mitigation on existing roadways, I think it gives a clear picture of, of the product we're going to end up with in, in the end. Brian, can I say something? Certainly. Sure. Um, I'd like for us to differentiate between un an unconstrained network and unconstraining these five segments. Um, to me, there's no value in running a total unconstrained network. In other words, Tidewater Drive, Virginia Beach Boulevard, um, you know, Mercury Boulevard, pretending that they have unlimited capacity is just confuses the issue um, because they don't and they never will. So, um, it, on the other hand, it do, does make sense to run the five segments unconstrained, which you do getting into the weeds a little bit by giving them like 10 lanes each or whatever. Um, it does make sense to run them unconstrained initially to, you know, to see what you got. And as somebody said, to see where people would want to go with, with these 
uh, three, you know, new segments uh, in there and with unlimited capacity on uh, I, uh, on Virginia 164 and I-664. So I'd, I'd like for us to differentiate between when we say unconstrained, whether we're talking unconstrained on the total network, which again makes no sense, or unconstrained, unconstraining these five segments. Brian, can I ask a question? This is Steve at Navy. Sir. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't know what the difference is between unconstrained and constructability. Uh, is in that I remember Mayor Rowe asked him the last time that we add constructability in there. So what part, where does that come into this analysis aspect? And what is the difference between unconstrained and or the constructability aspect? Hey, this is Craig Eddie. Um, constructability is not a factor here. We're just trying to uh, see where where people really want to go if there were no restraints or constraints on on the facilities. So constructability would come in later when we um, determine how many lanes we think we need to provide, and then we look at its fit in its environment. Um, particularly yours, we've looked at very closely all the constraints for. Um, the 164 connector, uh, we would, that's when the constructability analysis would come into play. But that's not a factor right now. We're just dealing with, with volumes and not worrying about constructability or permittability. Okay. Thank you. Yep. This is Brian Fowler again. Um, well, and I just, just one quick, I think when we're talking about the unconstrained, we're, we're talking more about a higher level concept, which is travel markets and trying to accommodate travel markets rather than rather than focusing on road segments. But um, I, I, I heard what Rob said, and and I certainly agree that there's some logic um, in, in what he said um, because you know the entire network being unconstrained, there could be additional um, impact to you know traveling from somewhere in Newport News to traveling somewhere in Virginia Beach, you know, in terms of travel time, in terms of how that impacts trip distribution, um, all of those things. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not unopposed to the idea of agreeing with what, with what he said. And, and another way to do this is to just, you know, look at these volumes that we have now um and say okay the next time we run this if we do unconstrained we're just going to code you know enough lanes on those facilities that you know facility capacity is really not going to be a constraint for crossing the water um and so um other aspects of travel time impacted by the network on land or, or inland or not not as not as part of these segments will still be being reflected. Um, so, you know, good point, Rob. I, I don't, I, I think that's probably, if we continue, if, if the next step is to look at, un, continue to look at unconstrained, that might be a better way to go about it. Um, and, and again, I, I think that you could go either way. Um, and, and I guess what I would, what I would, suggest a little bit is I mean let's just let's do both I don't think it I don't think it's that much work um, to do again it's it's either two or three network alternatives to start with depending on whether or not you have a 1615 combination um, based on looking at this map um, and and do it that way for unconstrained and do it for and do it for the 2045 baseline. And I mean, do it unconstrained with the 2045 baseline and assuming that the lineages are per the. Per the uh, per the SEIS where the place that our starting point. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to propose something. This is Craig. So, 
here, here everyone saying, see, see if this makes sense. We will run a 2045 run with the baseline with um, E plus C network, but with unconstrained um, segments for the mandated one. That's the combination I think Rob was talking about. So that would kind of give us uh, the reality of um, the rest of the regional network and only play with the demands that are on these proposed um, segments. So we're on the 2045 baseline with the E plus C network and, and, the, um, and the unconstrained uh, mandated segments. And then um, we do using the 2045 baseline E plus C network, we look at um, unconstrained conditions for the three um, combinations of segments that Brian mentioned adding in um, 15 and 14 in combination, 16 and 14 in combination, and 16 and 15 in combination. And, and, and with all those, um, 664 is in there and 164 is in there. So those three additional runs would have different combinations of four dated segments. But Craig, would those all have the widening for I-664 in there too? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, meant. That's what I mentioned. What, the 664 widening is in for all three, the 164 um, widening is in for all three, and then um, one, one is the uh, 664 connector with the 564 connector, the other one Brian mentioned was um, the 564 connector to the 164 connector. And then the third one was the 664 connector with the 164 connector. So in these three additional runs, we have different combinations of four mandated segments. And for the five segments unconstrained runs, does, uh, does that include uh, unconstrained for capacity on 664 from Bowers Hill to I-64? Yes. Craig, for a comparative analysis, can we? is there merit in running an unconstrained 664 and 164 and not including the 14, 15, and 16? Yeah, we can do that. Please do. So if I understand right, it's a 2045 baseline E plus C network with just two mandated, mandated segments, 664 and 164, correct? Yeah, I think that'll allow us to see if we plug that, that additional east-west crossing in what the difference is between that and just you know expanding our existing facilities. Okay, so I've got a total of five runs here that the group would like to see. All right, now it allow us after the five runs, would you know, assuming we could have some design modifications for them to get to the ten that we have scoped. Yeah, we yeah, we could do that. And you know, after we look at these um, four combinations of segments, you might be able to say, you know, some of them don't make a lot of sense going forward. So um, but that that's fine. We'll, we'll, uh, we're happy to do these five runs. Yeah, I think that'll give us a, uh, a better footing for starting to, to get into some refinement. Uh, Robbie, five runs would be 664 and 164 together, unconstrained without the three segments, and then 15 and 14 to modern Merrimack with the modern Merrimack widening, 14 and 16 together, and 15 and 16, I believe. 
And that's only four. And I wasn't going to ask the same question because I'm not seeing five. Well, do we want we want to run one that is 14, 15, 16, and uh, modern rare map? Well, the, the first one, the first one I stated was um, all five segments unconstrained. All right. And then we then we developed four different combinations where one we're only doing two of those five, six sixty four, and one or that's what Brian just suggested. And then the other three that Brian suggested would be unconstrained for four different segments. And there's different combinations of segments, 60, 64 and 164 and consistent with all three. And then the other differentiation comes with the combination of 14, 15, 16. You add 15 and, uh, 14 and 15 to one, you had 15 and 16 to another, and you had 14 and 16 to the other. So in my mind, we have one with five uh, unconstrained segments. We have three different combinations of four unconstrained segments, and we have one with two unconstrained segments. I'm still lost. But honestly, I don't understand where we're, where the variation is. If we just if we just talk about 15, 14, and 16, to me, there's one with none of them that Brian clearly suggested. There's one with all of them. That's two. There's one with 16 and 14. There's one with 15 and 16, and there's one with 15 and 14. So you're right, there's five. <laughs> Thank you. I've talked, I've talked myself through it. All right, and the, the last three you mentioned would be in combination of improvements with 664 and 164. Yes, those, those would always stay constant. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So we're clear, at least I am. <laughs> Rob, you got it? Um, yeah, just to clarify, for the last three runs, which are the pairs of new segments, would 664 and 164 be unconstrained? Yes. Okay. And this is Troy from Chesapeake. It would be unconstrained because we're assuming that all those improvements would be in place. I'm just thinking back to Bowers Hill where, you know, the, that, that original Bowers Hill study was run as unconstrained and that 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 project that required the additional work on 664 is kind of what put the created the new barrel cell study so just confirming that there, it'll be unconstrained because those improvements will be in place in the model uh troy it's been constrained as a, the first step you know the, the iterative process of we see where the traffic wants to be and then we start getting into refinement towards design elements and, and Placing constraints on it. Ten four. Thanks. All right, we have discussion for this item. All right, we're hearing none. Let's move to item six. Uh, this is. Uh, Diary of key decision points that was attached. Does anyone have comments or question? All right. It's pretty much outlook. Yeah, so um, we wanted to give you a snapshot uh, of what what was coming up um, rather than just going meeting to meeting. So um, next slide, please, Keith. So you know, we're, we're going to be determining the preliminary alternatives. We're working on those five runs we just identified. Uh, we're going to be completing the phase two documentation. There's one to be finalized and there's two draft memo, uh, one draft memo, one report to be circulated. So we'll be working on that. Uh, we do have a next working group meeting on January the 14th. We are planning on holding a scenario planning virtual meeting sometime late in January, date to be determined as the, uh, the team gets their um, information and formatting and uh, site built out. Um, and then 
you know, once we get the preliminary alternatives determined, perhaps at that January 14th meeting or sometime after, thereafter, we'll know which segments to look at refining. Um, because it was as, as it was mentioned before, we don't want to spend time looking at refining on anything that on any segment that we don't include in an alternative. Um, and they will assess those segments, permittability and constructability, which gets to Steve's question. And then we have a couple other working group uh, meetings scheduled, one in February and one in March. So that's our three month outlook. Any questions about that? Um, I guess I get this, Brian. I don't. I don't know if I have questions, or if I just think we need to look a little bit further out and need to get into more detail. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, some of one of the things that you brought up earlier, which is this is there's a two tier process actually going on here, where some of the more detailed things that we're going to do we're not going to do for all of these we're this is this is preliminary alternative stage and then we're going to select a smaller group and, and call them candidate alternatives and they are going to go through a more robust um analysis and evaluation and and some of this some of this probably permittability and constructability digging down into more detail is not really going to happen until we're uh, in, in the candidate stage, um, I think, um, and also when when the other types of modeling runs are going to come into play, when the free val analysis is going to occur, I thought the free val analysis first one was going to be on 2045 baseline E plus C. Um, yeah, that should be uh, done by the end of January, Brian. Okay, so so I I just think that we would all be much better served if we could drill down a little bit more and have something laid out better to understand how all the pieces work fit and work together and when um okay um i think the next slide is our schedule so that gets to your point good segue checks in the mail so i know that's small and it's hard to read but you know that is our um revised schedule. So um, to Brian's point, um, pre preliminary alternatives identification, uh, perhaps I was a little ambitious thinking we could get it all done today, so we'll have to push that out. Um, but um, we are going to be doing, um, the scope says the um, permittability and constructability assessments will be conducted on the, pre on the um, preliminary alternatives that we're developing now, these 10, because we don't want to carry forward anything that isn't permittable or constructible. So we want to get that screening done. That is part of the screening to narrow down to the three candidate uh, alternatives that will go and compare down here to the scenario um, plans. So, um, you know, we'll need to move that out a little bit, but. Um, and then once we have them, that's when the geometry and all these detailed engineering things will take place so we can see what's involved with them. But it all starts with traffic and that's the preliminary alternatives um, um, part that we're embarking on right now. So to my comment, and I, I guess I should ask, do you have another slide yet <laughs> that's gonna answer the question, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that what I'm asking for is taking the, this part of the schedule the next six months and expanding it a little bit and, and going in, showing some of the details that are parts of some of these tasks um, to help us better understand, you know, the, the activities that are going to take place and, and how they sort of flow um, together in uh, in, in, in some ways, in sort of a critical path, you know, this feeds into this, this feeds into this. Um, this is just this is just too high level to I think get to the get to the core of what I'm thinking. We would all be it would all be helpful for us to understand and and, and see a little bit better how some of the detailed pieces of what's supposed to happen over the next six months fit together.
the man's opinion. Anything more? No, I think that's it from uh, me, Brian. All right. Do uh, we have any other items of interest for the group? Well, I thank you all for your you work today and good, good conversation and, and uh, discussion. Um, we'll stand adjourned until the 14th. Take care. Thanks, everyone.